Okay, we're live. Okay, good evening, everyone. Welcome to uh, another city council working meeting. So uh, for those of you that might be new to this, uh, this is just, you have the ability to listen in to us just discussing some some city business that the council needs to go through. There's no votes taken or anything like that. There's, there's no public input. Um, it's just the council and some of the staff discussing items that you, you get to listen in on the conversation. Um, so with that, uh, I guess we can get going. Uh, I guess, why don't we talk about the uh, the garage appraisal and uh, the city garage property. All right, that's me talking about that. Um, we have an offer on the table for 1.7 million to buy the city garage, um, which is on, what is it, Long Beach Boulevard. Um, so we decided, well, we knew that in order to really look at the offer, we needed to have the garage appraised. We received two appraisals, 1.4 million and another appraisal for 2 million. Um, the buyer would like to buy the garage to put a Popeyes there. And they are willing to buy the property and wait for the city to uh, build a new garage before they take ownership. So the team met um, to talk about the placement of the new garage. We have looked at the spacing exactly where it would go but have determined that it's going to cost us around four and a half to $5 million to build a new garage that would actually benefit the city. By putting the buses in the garage, we know that we can, um, we know that we can get uh, at least 80% of the build, the build out funded, but that's a year down the road. We can start to apply for it. We have to get the plans and then we would look for other grants to fund the, the funding of the building of the garage. What I do know is that the, the uh, gentleman that would like to buy the garage is now under a timeline to purchase the property from us because Popeyes may end up going to, others are looking at putting up Popeyes and it may go to Oceanside. But in all honesty, we cannot, the staff and I talked about it, no, honesty, we can't say that we will be ready to go in a year because we have to make sure we have the funding to build a new garage because the city does not have $5 million to um, build a new garage, basically. Okay. Uh... I think Ray is on the phone as well. Yeah, Ray, do you want to add anything to it? He's muted. Ray, you're muted if uh, you're talking. Can you hear me now? Yep. There you go. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, we hired two uh, reputable appraisers from Nassau County. Uh, they came in, you know, a little bit di different numbers, but the offer is right in the middle. Uh, I reviewed both appraisals and they're pretty much made sense. And we were chatting with the council as well. Uh, and, you know, a fast, food restaurant would make sense on the uh, Long Beach Boulevard corridor. Um, that's pretty much it. Ray, what would, yeah, Ray, what would uh, a commercial property like a Popeye's probably pay in taxes on um, something over there? Uh, a fast food restaurant, it's based on the gross receipts, uh, the income of the gross mm -hmm. receipts. And like, for example, like a McDonald's or the Burger King, Pay about ten to fifteen thousand dollars a year in city taxes, not including school or county. Okay, all right. Uh, so any idea? Any you know, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was just wondering. I mean, th there's like that's a one point four million and and two million is a pretty wide discrepancy. It's like a forty three percent spread there. Um, any idea? I, I I know you said it came down in the middle. I guess uh, any idea why such a, a wide discrepancy in the two two appraisals? Uh, one appraisal was strictly looking at 
fast food while the other appraisal spread it out a little bit more to see what else might be interested. Uh, it was based on different cops. Okay. Uh, so that's the difference between the two appraisals. All right. So the, the offer that's been made seems reasonable then. Right. The so, offer that was made was $1.7 million. So um, I believe that they would pay the, the bulk of the, I think I sent you all the documentation of the new offer that they gave us. So they would give the city the bulk of the money up front. So if we sold it for $2 million, um, that means the city has to come up with $3 million, but we still will have to find the funding. Right. So it, it, we can ask um, them to appear at the council meeting to see how long, if he were to purchase the property, how long they were willing to wait for the city to build um, the garage because it's it would take a while. Yeah, and how much how much certainty is there that we would get that grant money to build the garage? I mean, what happens if we sell the property and we don't get the grant money? And that's a very good question. Um, then we got then we got nowhere to work on on the vehicles. Right. Um, I do know that Mike Robinson was working on uh, what I believe is MTA to find out about it. Um, right now, they are aware that we do need to upgrade the garage, but the way we're looking at it is not just that we, it would be a garage for the buses; it would be a garage for all of the vehicles. So none of the city vehicles will be outside. Okay. So so we would move everything over there, including like the sanitation and all that too? All of their vehicles. Yes. Okay. So, so obviously it's got to be bigger than what's on what's there now. Yes. And we've all looked at the space and right now um, where, uh, where we were looking, the city purchases quite a bit of wood um, and all of the wood is kept outside. And so if we move sanitation and all of the vehicles over to the garage with the buses, then all of the equipment that we need for building such as wood would move to the sanitation garage and then it would be inside. Okay, so we're not Obviously, storing stuff The way outside. the staff planned it out works very well, but we gotta make sure we have the money. So if we were to uh, decide to sell the property, could it be contingent on getting the grant? So in other words, if the grant doesn't materialize, so we would not be able to build a new garage that then the sale doesn't go through? Now that that would be, we would have to talk to uh, council. Okay. That could be put forth to them. Um, I think that the one of the reasons why the gentleman is anxious to buy the property is because other people are other people are trying to get a Mac, uh, a Popeyes. I was getting ready to say McDonald's, but a Popeyes. And okay. so he potentially, if they beat him to it, he won't be able. He will not purchase the property. Okay. Yeah. Um, go ahead. I don't want to monopolize this. If other people got questions, Donna, Donna, when you when you first started, we we didn't have an inventory of how many vehicles we actually have. Do we now know how many vehicles we have? Um, they're completing the inventory now. Um, mm -hmm. We do know that we have vehicles that have absolutely no use because they can't be driven. And mm -hmm. so they're updating the vehicle listing now. Um, and we, is, go ahead. Are we, are we in compliance with all rules and regulations, whether local, um, county, state, or federal in terms of the management of our garage right now? Um, you know, Karen, I can't answer that question as far as the management of the garage. We know that we are trying to implement other policies and procedures, um, mm -hmm. but I, I won't, uh, I, I can get back to you on that one. Okay, so, you know, my initial assessment is that we're putting the, the cart before the horse here. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I am, uh, right now I have a little um, concern that the uh, the staff is not ready for such a, a big develop for such a big move and nor are we financially prepared to do so unfortunately that's my assessment right now okay anyone else got any uh mike you look like you're leaning forward like you got a question um let me see am i um okay 
Um, I just got a couple of questions. Um, zoning is the area where the garage is currently. Could it be zoned for a purchaser such as this? Um, do they have to go to a hearing or do we have to do anything? The other is, I believe it's in an enterprise zone, which would give the purchase, any purchaser, um, I, I guess, some kind of tax benefit. I believe it's a federal grant that we're talking. Would it, would it be a transportation uh, mm. authority? I'm, I'm not sure, but there may be other grants, but I'm not an expert. And that is basically a, a question that I have is, is a zoning issue. I know it's a city garage, but is it in an area that would allow for that particular developer to come in? That's all my question. As we've been talking about it, we really hadn't talked about the zoning, so I'll check on it. And if it is in the, is it, if it is in an enterprise zone, then it, we will if the person will in fact get a break. Um, the okay. building will not be built. Um, the building won't be built by staff itself. Um, but whether the property is sold to the gentleman who wants to build the Popeyes or not, this is something that we are going to have to look at in the very near future because our equipment and everything is depreciating faster because everything is sitting outside. Should I had Donna is, um, am well, I Mike, muted or? Mike, yeah. the uh, property is in the federal opportunity zone. And also the zoning allows for a one story retail, which the fast food restaurant would fit. Would fit, okay. Um, the last question, and it only came up an, an hour ago or today, we had a pretty heavy rain. So I didn't know if that garage had, it was impacted or that area was impacted. Um, yes, the garage was impacted. Um, okay. And so as we went through today, we are looking at to see what we, what we can do um, because we ended up having to send staff home. Um, and I believe that just like everywhere else, it came down, the rain came down so fast that, that they didn't have time to, to adjust. So I guess it would make sense, Donna, to move or to look at moving the garage somewhere else, and basically. Yes. I'm not, not somewhere else from what you've looked at already, just it makes sense to move the vehicles in the garage to a different location. Yes, and the garage needs a lot of work. And so the key, the reason we were trying to figure this out is because we don't want to put a lot of money into the garage and then turn around and sell it, but it does need work. And so that we're trying to assess now how much work it, it will need. And if some of that work has to be done for the winter. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, um, the potential location for the garage uh, there was also there. There has been some talk over time of that could also potentially be a location if we were to ever do a new city hall. Um, how would we? I mean, are we precluding ourselves from giving us that um, to to somehow be able to use that space? If we build a garage there, in other words, uh, we might want to think about how the space is used, where we might be able to either potentially put a city hall there at some point. Uh, again, if we can get some some money for that um, or add on to the building to create a city hall. Because, you know, we've been having those conversations that the money we're putting in to maintain the current building, it might be at some point cheaper to pay a mortgage on a on a new building. Uh, we'll take a look at that with the layout. Okay. All right, anybody else uh, got any questions about this or comments? All right, hearing none, uh, let's see. How about, uh, I see our 
acting police commissioner is on. How about we get uh, some updates from him? That's you, Phil. You're muted, Phil. Hold on, we're trying to get him to unmute. Okay, I think I'm unmuted now. Can you hear me? Yep. Hi, everybody. Uh, just to give you a brief overview of what's going on with the PD, um, I know the calendar says that the Beach Park summer is over, um, and we're not, uh, it, it's done September 7th. It's not, and it's no time to get complacent, in my opinion. Uh, it's still going to be warm out for a while. September is a very warm and good month, as we know, in Long Beach. And schools, high schools, are uh, tentative at best in regards to their, uh, their classes. There's online, there's in-class, which means that we're probably going to have a lot of uh, young adults that have a lot of free time. So my feeling is that we should certainly keep the modified hours on the beach for now and reevaluate as we move along. But I, I think if we try to change the, the hours that we put in for the beach and the boardwalk, um, it'd be a tremendous mistake. We might end up right back where we were at the beginning of July. Um, just to let you know, what we've done this summer, what the police department has done uh, in the West End, I'll start with them. We, as you all know, we've, we've increased patrol we have bicycle patrols. We've had bicycle patrols all summer long. Um, two sergeants, two police officers, back and forth. Um, they've issued over 1,000 municipal code summonses, which is huge. Um, and we've towed over 266 motor vehicles. We try to keep the quality of life up for our residents. And it's probably one of the highest numbers of uh, impounds and summonses that we've had in recent years. Our summer specials we talk about all the time. They uh, they issued over 700, they, not over, but they issued 787 municipal code summonses for all the quality of life summonses that or violations uh, that occur on a beach. Um, in addition, they've also uh, done the modified beach hours, which was a difficult task closing the beach at eight o'clock and the boardwalk at nine o'clock and have done it effectively. As we move forward, most of we lose most of our specials. We still have some that are going to be working for us uh, hourly. Uh, we'll have them working with uh, Joe Brand's crew, closing up the beach, closing up the boardwalk. I'm going to continue to have a police officer on the beach every night. Just one. We've reduced it, but they'll assist in closing everything down and closing the beach and the boardwalk. Uh, at 8 o'clock and 9 o'clock so we don't have stragglers and we'll work closely with Joe or we'll closely with Tom, um, uh, Tommy Cannon with that. As far as our other communities go, um, well, with the West End, I deal very closely with the West End uh, neighbors. And they've told us what they wanted and we've worked with the SLA, the state, with the inspections and the enforcement of licensed premises, um, and it's been successful. I believe, and I've been out there, that they're adhering to the rules and the regulations. Uh, I think they're doing well, but in fact, they're doing what they need to do to make sure that they comply with the rules. In our other communities, in the North Park and the Channel Park home communities, our police department has worked very closely with Channel Park. I'll start with them. Uh, Mike Cruz, who runs uh, Channel Park, um, in addition, uh, Myra De Jesus, who is the Tenant Association president, we've met numerous times and we worked on different um, agendas that they have. And I believe we've come to good resolutions. We have police officers patrolling North Park, excuse me, Channel Park every night. We have two police officers every tour going through addressing all the quality of life uh, problems they have, which is open alcohol. Marijuana use, large groups, dirt bikes, narcotics, et cetera. Um, and we're out there and we're enforcing that. We, we're in the process of putting up new 
um, street markings for the crosswalks for the children, uh, all along National Boulevard, and signage for uh, children to play for their safety. As far as North Park goes, we're working with the North Park Crisis uh, Intervention Unit. It's a really great team of people from North Park, a really good group uh, led by Ms. Odom. And we're training them in Narcan use, first aid training. We're working very closely on peaceful resolutions of any conflicts or any um, interactions they have with the police. We're showing them how you should deal with the police department and what all your options are after that encounter to address any complaints you have uh, in regards to that encounter. And we have many avenues and many uh, ways to go in regards to what the, uh, the community could do if they feel they were grieved. As far as traffic goes, we have a couple of grants right now, step grants, DWI grants, they're in progress. They'll be out in the morning. Um, it's fully funded by the Nassau County Traffic Safety Board, where uh, we're addressing uh, aggressive driving, speeding, cell phone usage, no seatbelts, and uh, DWI grant that we have. So we'll be out for the next couple of months doing that, and it's, uh, it's fully funded uh, by the county. And I believe that's kind of where we're at. Um, all I can say is there may be some questions about what we're doing with the beach and the boardwalk. My honest opinion is we need to keep it closed for now and keep the hours the way it is, the way, it, the way they are. Uh, it's warm out. People are gonna, the young kids are going to come out. We can reevaluate, but it has to stay the way it is for now. Any questions? Um, Phil, this is Donna. I want to, the, the corner, what was it Neptune? The corner where we had the hit and run and then we had the other gentleman that got hit. We're gonna change that from, that you can make a right on red to no turn on red. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Donna. Yes, so we uh, actually, I spent a day evaluating that going through uh, our resolutions and, and uh, the VTL and yes, so the signs that, if, for those who don't know, at Neptune Boulevard and Park Avenue, for traffic that's proceeding westbound on Park and traffic that's coming southbound on Neptune to turn right going westbound to Park, it says no turn on red uh, during school hours, and it says 6 a.m. Uh, to 4 p.m. We've had numerous accidents there, and it's been very problematic. It really should be a true no turn on red. Um, I got the green light today through legal, and uh, tomorrow morning we'll be removing the other signs, and it'll be a true no turn on red effective tomorrow. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Phil, uh, since you've been keeping stats because uh, you, you've been giving them to us at other update meetings, would it be possible uh, to get like a monthly report on how many summonses have been issued and things like that? Absolutely. I, I, I get them monthly from the courts, so I can absolutely 100% send it out to you guys. Um, I'm looking at one right now. And just to give you, well, it was, it's not as recent. It's from September 4th is the latest update, but just so you know, and I'll uh, We've issued 5,301 5, parking summonses. Um, there's been 182 arrests in Long Beach, 1,071 municipal code violations, and uh, 650 traffic summonses issued. That's vehicle and traffic law summonses, red lights, stop signs. Um, I get that weekly, and I can certainly scan it over to the city council and city manager. Yeah, that would be great, because then we, we could get a you know indication of a enforcement action and stuff like that do, do we also track things like um animal control and uh because uh, i believe they fall under you right they do they, they work under the police but animal control and sanitation are both working uh enforcement with oh the okay department. so do you track those as well yes we do okay so can we include those too certainly all right Again, john great 
and maybe Don, if we could, uh, uh, since we're on a on that topic, I guess maybe uh, buildings department too. Uh, if the inspectors there are issuing summonses too, if we can maybe get, I guess maybe okay. monthly a monthly update, you know, or something like that, just just so we have an indication of what's going on on uh, enforcement actions uh, across the city. Uh, okay. And I, I think that's a good idea, John, because I think the numbers actually can show the public and our residents how hard that uh, the police department, the building department, et cetera, are working. Well, yes, yeah, certainly it'll, uh, yes, people at least, you know, can see what's going on out there then. You know, there's, there's data to support it. Right. One of the other um, reports that we are talking to the building department about is that every time a new store is coming to the city that we are notified and you all are notified that this is coming. And so then we can put it, find a place on the website to say upcoming businesses, new businesses, um, so that we know and that people won't be surprised to see a sign go up about a new business. And we, you know, no one really knew that it was coming. Good idea. Anybody got any questions for Phil? Mike? I have. Oh, um, well, ahead, I just, just a quick question regarding um, where the money goes for the fine. So I'm assuming, which I don't like to do, um, for the building department, that money, if they have an enforcement issue, comes directly to the city and doesn't go to the court. But anything with police related would have to go to the court first. I'm sorry, Liz. So you took a building and beach. I apologize. Well, if I, got fine, well, if I got a fine for a traffic, I know that I would go to the Long Beach Police Department. But if I got a fine right. for my lawn being outrageously and I've got vermin, etc., I'm assuming Scott's going to give me a, a fine and I have to pay directly to the city of Long Beach and I don't go to a court. Or is there a building court? Oh. I can I, I can jump I, in a little I, bit I, if you want. Okay. It's rich. Um, so, I, I think what you're asking, uh, Liz, whenever whenever I'll, I'll give you the division. So, if you're written up for a VCO or or a ticket, everyone goes to city court. City court basically has jurisdiction over everything from a misdemeanor and under. Uh, when you're fined or when you're issued a summons or citation, our office prosecutes anything under a misdemeanor. Um, so if you're fined, let's say from the, if you receive a summons or a, or a notice of violation from the building department and you're prosecuted and found guilty, the court imposes that fine and then a portion that, that fine is then remitted or remanded to the city. Depending on uh, what the violation is, there are certain surcharges that must go to the state. Um, and that's something that we can't control. Uh, so it's like a, like a VTL or a moving violation, for example, there's typically like an $88 surcharge for, uh, for running a red light in addition to the fine that you pay, which is remanded to the city. Um, so I hope that helps. I'm Liz, you were muted, but I'm gonna assume that means you got you the answer you wanted. Just give me a <laughs> thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, all right, Mike. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Mike. Okay. I, Phil, I have a bunch of questions, so I, I don't expect that you'll know all the answers tonight, but I'll shoot them out. Sure. Mike, can, Mike, can, um, you, Mike, can you do them one at a time? Am I doing one at a time? Yeah. I get conf I'm getting sure. confused on, on what you're asking. Um. You're getting confused on what I'm asking. I haven't asked anything yet. Well, exactly. <laughs> I'm confused. Uh, so when you ask them all at once, it's confusing. So just ask them, ask one at a time, so we can write the answers okay. down. I'd like to know the short-term and long-term plan for the boardwalk. Will closures continue at 9 p.m. or can we relax them um, to? 11 p.m., 12 p.m., or just knock that off entirely. Right. So obviously the city manager and the city council make that ultimate decision. If you want my input, and I think I addressed it earlier, Mike, 
You should you absolutely keep the modified hours in place. And then it, it's, I hate to use the word fluid, but it's fluid. We'll see what happens October 1. And then if the city manager asks my opinion, the city council, I'll tell you what I think enforcement-wise, what I see. But for now, I think it would be a tremendous mistake to relax anything. We have to keep our foot on the gas um, for the next for next month at least and see where we go. But um, if we if we try and pull back and roll back what we've done, it could be really bad. And that's that's my okay. law enforcement opinion. Okay, because keep in mind the questions I'm going to ask have been asked of me. So um, sure, of course. Uh, okay, Mike, and I I want to respond to that question as well. So the boardwalk is closed at nine o'clock. And I have had to call um, Phil to have people go down to the beach after 10 or 11 o'clock because we have several youth on the beach. Loudly, um, residents are complaining. And so can you imagine if the boardwalk was open, that's where they'll be. Um, and so, it, I mean, when we go, I see the cars go by at nine o'clock at night and they're taking people off the beach um, and saying, you gotta leave, you sh you're supposed to leave at eight o'clock. So we just have to be mindful one, why we close or why we change the hours in the first place. Um, and then if we change them back, how will we deal with large crowds? Because some of these kids are still going to the beach even after hours. Okay. Um... Have, uh, Phil, have you issued any violations for being on the beach and or the boardwalk after either 8 p.m. or 9 p.m.? Yes, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, the stats. We, we try and do uh, compliance. We're just giving you know, verbal warnings and just tell them to get off. But there have absolutely been summonses issued uh, for that, for, for those who do not comply voluntarily. Um, and we try and do it that way. I can say, and I'm out there a lot at night, the crowds have kind of fallen into place and they know when we go up and down at eight o'clock on the beach, they're really clearing out. And at nine o'clock, they're doing the same. It's kind of, they they know it's the new normal. And, and the groups that are out there are really minimal. Um, we have issued summonses. Mike, I don't have the number, um, okay. but we do do it virtually. Yeah, I'm just trying to think, is this a locational issue, center of town, or is it all over town? It's, it's all over. It's, tr it's, the, it's the boardwalk and all over town. We have a big issue, as Don said, unfortunately, our rest of the town. Um, by the Azores, that's a big issue because they go back and forth, uh, you know, between Lido and us. And you can get on through Lido, come around. And we have the same issue on the West End. You come over from EAB and you work your way over. So that's a problem. But the boardwalk is like a magnet. People want to come up there. But I can say it really has been um, minimal. Minimal. They, the groups are getting it. They know, okay, these are the hours, just like they did with the, the um, bicycling hours. At first, it met some resistance. And then eventually, everyone kind of got it. Okay. It was, you know, now it's changed again. But when we first put it in place, 10 a.m., and they got their bike riding in and left. And no one really kind of complained. They just knew that's the rules. So um, I, I, I don't think it's a huge problem now. I think the groups are understanding it. And um, that's the reason I say we should keep it up. Because the minute you lift it, social media will go wild. And you'll have them all out on the beach and boardwalk again. Okay. Um, and I don't know if this is your answer Phil or the question of the galvanized steel uh, gates is that going yeah, up Tommy, in every and... okay that's time I'll save that for later okay okay um there was a sign that went up recently I noticed on New York Avenue uh, about e-scooters is that something that is new that we're uh, we're enforcing the no e-scooters on the boardwalk in addition to skateboards and everything else? Right. Um, 
Mike, those signs, the East Scooter signs, the regulations of the beach didn't go up really recently. They went up beginning of the summer, around Memorial Day or so. The long, the, the long signs you saw, um, on the bottom it says, no e-bikes. Um, that was ordered by the, the prior administration before I came into the uh, into this office. But um, it's been up for probably three months at this point. Um, and it, it is illegal or unlawful to have uh, a scooter or an electric bike on the boardwalk. And it, it's a real hazard. I'm sure if you've been up there, you see there's, there's, there's some young men and women or some older young men and women driving the electric bicycles at, at a high rate of speed. And we have a section that's already in the municipal code section, you know, uh, laws, uh, section 15, I believe, dash 5A, which says you can't do that. You can't eat. As a matter of fact, I'd argue that you can't even have it present because what the people that the boardwalk goers who have an electric bicycle will do is they'll start pedaling and then they'll, you know, if they see a, a special or a police officer and then they'll, they'll put it onto the next mode and they'll, they'll ride it really fast. The section we have, and it probably something for Rich to talk about, but I believe just simply having it up there and propelling it by feet foot or not is a violation. Um, and it's it's becoming really problematic, and it's absolutely a dangerous situation. I, I I believe we need to get them off the boards. Um, I think the other issues, um, just in a simple statement, is, and you you probably heard me mention this once before, Phil. Um, issuing a thousand summonses is great; shows a lot of activity. But I'm a money guy. How much does it translate into money? And I know you don't know the answer to that, but I think President Bendo alluded to the fact that we couldn't get some kind of correlation. I think that's Liz's question too, is if you, when you write a violation, how enforceable is it and how does it change the behavior and the city collect the fine? So that would be helpful, I think. Liz, did that- so I would Right. I would answer two part question, Mike. So the first part, how does it change behavior? You know, I'm a big believer, like Pavlov's dog, you know, negative reinforcement does a lot. And I believe on, on the beach and on the sand itself, when someone who's on the beach doing something that's not acceptable and is violating our rules and regulations, whether it be, you know, drinking alcohol or having a dog on the beach, whatever it may be, um, receive a summons they're apprehensive to do it again. And the word kind of spreads. So as far as the actual um, summons itself, I, I believe that does a lot to correct poor behavior. As far as the courts go, we have two judges and they have the, you know, the decision-making uh, power to decide what they're going to do to adjudicate its summons. We can reach out to the court and I know they have the numbers and we can figure out what our Long Beach court or it's actually run by New York State, but what they're actually um, doing as far as uh, adjudicating the tickets and the fines they're um, imposing and seeing how much money that's bringing in. Um, but it, but on my end, on the law enforcement end, writing the summons itself is huge because right. if you have that omnipresence and if you're out there and you believe if I do the wrong thing, there's going to be a special or a police officer out there giving me summons, you're going to be a little apprehensive to do it. Um, and, and you need to continue that, that type of enforcement. So uh, as far as we go, we can't really do what we do saying, well, I wonder what's going to happen down the road. Is it really going to get enforced? We have to just write the summonses and, and hope that when it gets to the court, that end of it, um, they're prosecuted to the fullest extent. Right. Thank you. And then the last question I'll have, because I don't want to take up all the time, is the LPR readers, they flag um, parking violations that are outstanding or moving violations. Um, if somebody has, let's say, 20 parking tickets that they haven't shown up, will that show up on the LPR reader? That's question one. And question two, in your opinion, should we move forward with some kind of booting type of uh, to 
to disable a vehicle to force them to pay their fines? That's a great question, Mike. I actually have, and I in the last month, I've done exhaustive research on booting, and I have an entire procedure and policy to put into place that I'm about to present to all of you and the city manager. So yes, I'm a true believer in that, and there's a lot of revenue to be generated. We have a huge amount of scoff laws out there. We, in fact, our plate reader uh, can read scoff laws. So it, it can work great for us. Um, and I'll, I'll send it out to you tomorrow because it's in place. I just finished authoring the whole policy uh, for booting cars, and uh, I want to proceed with it. And I think it'll be really good to get parking spaces open, number one, with the cars that are, that are scoff laws and, par- and parked all over uh, Broadway and Beach Street and Park Avenue, get them out of there. And it's also a huge stream of revenue. Um, and I don't want to bore you with it, but I'll send it to all the city council and the city manager, and you can read it and see what my uh, procedure and policy is in regards. I'll feel yeah, I told, to send that I, to I, Ina as well, um, because one of the things we wanted to find out is how many tickets we had outstanding so we can do an amnesty day. So people can clear up some of their tickets before, and then the threat would be that if you don't clear it up, we will boot your car. That's a that, that's a great thought, Donna. And I actually I have that exact number and all the data for you, so I can send it to you in, actually tonight. <laughs> all right, thank all you. Right. I feel You're welcome. Uh, just, uh, the last question: Is it harder to boot or ticket um, and collect out of state? license plates such as Florida, Texas, Georgia, if if they are a scoff law, are there differences when it comes to out-of-state plates? No, because the fine they have to pay is the fine that, that we're imposing on them here. So I don't care what you, no, sorry. I don't really, it doesn't matter to me what your plate says. The bottom line is if you want your car back, you're going to pay the fee that we have here or you're not going to get your car back. And just, I'm looking at it now, just so you know, is three hundred sixty-two thousand two hundred sixty dollars worth of scoff scoff law tickets that are out that are outstanding. That amount. Thank you. Three hundred sixty-two thousand plus. Thank you for that update. I'm sorry I, I I hit you with so many questions, but you sound pretty prepared. It's it's, it's, it's my job. It's my job, Mike. I'm fine with it. Whatever you want to ask me, ask me. <laughs> Yeah, and I ask questions not only for myself, but for others as well. Thank you. Certainly, of course. Phil and Mike, I just wanted to chime in. So we brought in approximately $1 million or a little bit over $1 million in fines last year um, through city court. And uh, we were on track to actually beat it until COVID hit. So we're hoping that we will at least be at the same level again. And I'm sure with the different innovative ideas that the Phil was just talking about, you know, we can certainly bring in more money. Thank you. Anyone else got any questions for Phil? Um, since Mike hinted at it and it kind of segues from what Phil was talking about with the, uh, with the beach and the boardwalk, why don't we uh, talk a little bit about, uh, I guess, what, what some people have dubbed gate gate. Um, so obviously, it's a couple of gates, I guess, showed up on the, on the boardwalk and social media exploded about it. So can we get uh, 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 what, ha- you know, what, they, what they are, what they're for? I, I mean, I can take a guess. I'm guessing they were probably came out of those huge parties we had on the beach, but I'll I'll let the people know, explain. I'll start. Um, We had two large parties of people come down, I think, and both parties were over 800 people. The only way that we could keep people off the boardwalk when needed was to have gates up, just as we did when COVID, um, that we had to block off the boardwalk. We put up the orange fencing and um, we know that we witnessing people take the orange fencing down, go around, put the orange fencing back up and go walk on the boardwalk or go to the beach. It, it was closed down because of COVID. So the idea was that we would put up fencing 
for several different reasons, but we couldn't figure out what type of fencing to put up. So what has been going up? I think the very first one that went up, we have, and uh, Ms. Canner can um, tune in on this. We have a very good carpenter. So he put the first one up and nobody was going around that fence, going over that fence, nothing. And it had wheels on it. And we said, you know, your craft work is very good, but that is not what we're speaking about. And so they took that one down. Then they put up another one um, because we don't want people to get hurt trying to go around it um, because we will have people trying to go around the fence as, they, as people do. Um, so another one went up and then they had two sides um, of plywood on each side and they, we took pictures and we said, no, that's not it either. Um, so they took that one down um, and then they put another one up. And once it was, once we got it together, we were going to invite you all to come down to take a look. But I wanted to remind everyone why, and we talked about this, why we talked about putting the fences up in the first place. The problem is we haven't found the right solution. So when people have been going through social media saying, did you see the fence? That's one, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to find out what we can do aesthetically so that it looks good, but it does what we need it to do. So Mr. McNally or Mr. Canner, you want to take over from there. So I'll, I'll jump in um, <clears throat> before I, I give it to Tommy. I'll, I'll jump in first, Tommy, before I hand it over to you for more of the, uh, the technical details on things. But um, what I would just say is when we, we first announced the need for the closings because we had gatherings of 800 youths uh, one weekend, then the police actually stopped a party before it was happening on a subsequent weekend. And then the following weekend, we had a crowd of 1,200. Um, that also coincided with a large number of drownings that took place after hours on the beach because the sheer number of people coming on after hours starting at six o'clock when the ticket takers were no longer there um, and saw the beach as an opportunity to hang out for several hours. Um, so that's why we closed the beach at eight o'clock. So the proposition was if you came after six o'clock, you only had two hours to be down there and it made it less of an attractive option. Plus when we swept the beach, um, the boardwalk, it was obviously the ultimate deterrent for no longer having those to place to socialize and hang out. Uh, the material that we had at our disposal initially in order to enact this was the snow fencing, which is what we've been using really ever since. Um, but even when we initially put that up, we knew that was not going to be a viable solution moving forward. So discussions internally with staff, we arrived at uh, a solution of the accordion gates, the kind of things that you would find at a Home Depot when Home Depot closes down an aisle. Um, and those were ordered. We initially thought that we would get them in approximately a week. It ended up taking closer to three weeks. Um, and obviously, as we get further away from the date of the initial incidents, everybody's memories fade about the, the urgency of the moment and the rationale for why exactly we were pursuing options along those lines. So uh, what Tommy has been doing, and I'll pitch it off to him since, is uh, his staff, even before they came in, uh, Donna spoke of the one big wall that got put up on Washington, and that thing was impressive as hell, obviously, <laughs> but not, uh, not, not the look we were, we were going for here. Um, and I won't recap what Donna was saying, but, you know, it's, we, we these, these uh, the, the, the accordion fences came in. Uh, we are cognizant that if we, if we are going forward with this as a solution that they would need to get painted with a rust-oleum or something along those lines so that they could they could stay longer. Um, but yeah, what 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 the public and what what the what the council has been seeing is us trying to figure out what the solution is. You know, because this could be not just for, um, you know, not just for the current issue at hand, but if hurricanes come along or some other reasons that are unforeseen as to why we would need to, you know, be able to make the boardwalk you know, a secure, a secure location, it, it gives us an option for it. So if we can find the right fit, we will find the right fit. Uh, and I think part of the, the point of this discussion tonight is to check with the council if we have found the right fit or if we need to keep looking. But, um, Tommy, uh, school me on anything else that I may have missed, please. No, you, you hit it all. Like uh, I was 
tasked with uh, closing the boardwalk up and, you know, me and my, my staff wanted to get it done right away. So, like you said, we used the material we had. It was definitely overbearing. Um, the snow fence, people just knock it over, so we have to keep purchasing it. And it's You know, it takes three rolls of snow fence to close the whole boardwalk at $55 a piece, and every night it gets wrecked and we have to replace it. And I have to send my uh, my staff up there, you know, to tie it up. And it's not rocket science, so it's a little involved. Uh, we then put up the barricades, like the police barricades, but we have to padlock them to the railings. And when people climb over them or they push on them, it scuffs the railing up. The boardwalk's beautiful. The railing, it's a polished aluminum. We all know how good it looks, and it's starting to get a little beat up. So as you said, John, we, uh, we went to a vendor that's on a state bid. It was the fastest way to purchase something on a more permanent basis, something that would be durable. And uh, Councilman Delore, you touched on on the gates. They're, uh, they're a galvanized steel, that's correct. And eventually they will rust. But as John said, we were going to paint them with a rust-oleum. We all know everything in Long Beach eventually rust. The only other option would be stainless steel. And that's the money that they want for that is five times what we paid for these gates to galvanize. It's just stain. And eventually they'll rust too. Just take a little longer. Our only other option to make it you know, aesthetically pleasing is to do something like the boardwalk railing, a polished aluminum. But that we would have to hire an outside vendor, put it out to bid because the cost would be astronomical. It'd look beautiful, but there would be a lot involved in it would be engineered drawings. They'd have to weld it to the boardwalk. And if we ever decided we didn't want it to take it down, we would, we'd have to hire somebody to take it down and it would, it would never be the same. So if we're going to close the boardwalk, I think this is probably our best bet. If everyone's on board to use these gates, um, like uh, the city manager said, we, we we dumped it down to about 18 inches on each side. We can paint that wood. We can we can cap it with something and then paint the steel gates. And one of the reasons that we went with this, it's six foot high, so nobody's going to climb over it. And with the system we have in place, a child can do it. I don't have to send anybody up there with tools. It doesn't acquire overtime. It doesn't acquire any specialty staff. You know, a 12-year-old child can just close the gate and put a padlock on it. So that was the thinking with the gates. Hope I covered everything. Any questions? So it sounds like we we sort of there's there's two separate issues to deal with. A the the need to be able to close or isolate the boardwalk, and then if that if we did that the aesthetics of how we do that. Um, I, I guess, you know, obviously the, the beaches around us, Nickerson and Jones beach and others have the advantages of, they just close the gate to the parking lot and that pretty much isolates the beach. We don't, we clearly don't have that. So I guess it's, it's a balancing act of, um, uh, you know, for us, the boardwalk is sort of the people's yard for a lot of people. So uh, uh, finding a balance of giving people access to the to the boardwalk, but being able, I guess, if we have to, I guess it's really not been an issue before, but we're in some unique circumstances now. But uh, uh, do we need to be able to isolate it? I guess that's that's the one. And then the other is, like I said, if we do it, how we do it. Uh, I think, John, I think you make a, you really uh, dissected the issue. There was the first issue of, you know, is there a need to be able to shut, uh, easily shut down the boardwalk? And I'm becoming more and more convinced that there is a need, unfortunately, in this, at, at, at this uh, day and time where um, we have access to protect the boardwalk, the residents. We don't have the luxury to have 24 seven um, police protection at every entrance. Uh, if 800 people decide to come one night and that um, we have a responsibility to protect it. And that maybe this is the time where we, uh, we unfortunately, the you know, days of past are, are, are gone and we might have to be able to quickly secure the boardwalk. Um, Tommy, what street is this? Um, is it currently on that if we wanted to take a look, we can go and take a peek? 
Laurelton Boulevard. One more, but what, what, what Boulevard? Laurelton Boulevard. Laurelton. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So, so Tommy, as far as the as if we did something, as far as the as aesthetics of it go, and maybe this also goes to the fact that uh, the, since Mike brought it up, the that it's galvanized steel. Um, however, it's anchored to the boardwalk. Like now at Laurelton, you said you got the thing down to six inches. It just looks like a couple of columns. On, on either side of the ramp, which you, like you said, you can cap with Azek or something to make it look nice. But um, might it make sense for both visual, so it doesn't look like we have these gates just hanging there when we may only need them very infrequently. Um, could they be? Could they be something be built where they're inside, like a a little cabinet type structure? that's closed and then when they are needed they're pulled out of that cabinet so they're not visible yes 100 100 percent that's that's the end game we just what you see now when you look at it it's just it's the the 18 inches of plywood with a few studs you know for for the stability and we just put the plywood on top of it so it does look it does look uh you know unfinished but we said, let's put it up, and once everyone's in agreement, city managers and council, that that's what we're going to do, we'll do exactly what you said, John. We'll paint the, the gates the color that you guys choose, and we'll stick it right inside the cabinet, like you said. It'll be finished. It'll look nice. Nobody will see it until the gates are pulled out. So, yes, we can definitely okay. do that. That's a great idea. Yeah, and it might give them some weather protection as well. Uh, I mean, I guess theoretically, we could even, if we wanted to get really fancy, make these things look like almost an archway into the, onto the boardwalk from the ramp. We can uh, definitely do that. You guys tell me what you want, and I'll make it happen. Because I, I know, okay, I'm thinking out of the box a little here, because one of the gripes we get often is people don't know what block they're walking past because the street signs seem to not always be there. So we could even potentially, if we build it like an arch, put the street name for that particular ramp on there so people know where they are just remember we can those do that what's that we can definitely go ahead i'm sorry just remember those surfboards however people carry them yes oh yeah yeah it's true, <laughs> this is true. And fishing poles. We, we do have signs already that were purchased um with money from sandy and we we finally got them a couple of years ago they're sitting in my shop. We just have to make a frame around them. We have signs that would go when you're coming on the boardwalk, you would know what street you're on, to your point. When you're coming off the beach up to the boardwalk, you would know where you are. So okay. and we have and we have at the end of the ramp. I think there's three signs for every boulevard. So we already have that. We wouldn't have to spend money on it. All right. So so yes. All right. So if we do this, we could certainly it sounds like from an aesthetic perspective, we can People probably won't even know there's gates there. We can build something nice looking that they won't even know there's gates there. That's correct. And then when the time comes, like I said, anybody can just pull the gates out and pay, pay lock them together. And and I guess uh, maybe this is on low for you, Tommy or John. I guess it's you said you ordered these. So we already have these gates on hand. Yes. OK. If it, for all the beach entrances, we have enough for all of them. Yes. Okay. Now, this is just along the boardwalk, though. I assume it wouldn't cover the west end as well, right? That's correct. Okay. Correct. So the gates were a little over $7,000 for, you know, all of them combined to cover the entire, what is it, 14 entrances to the boardwalk, Tommy? There's 19, which some 19. blocks have two ramps, and we bought one okay. extra. It was easier to buy 20 than 19 for some reason, or cheaper, I should say. And we have one extra. So, I mean, I think the other thing I would just take into consideration, Tommy, is we're looking at, and council, if we're looking at various prototypes or iterations of this, um, we just have to scope out what the other costs would be associated with it as we build it into beautiful archways uh, <laughs> so that we can, we can analyze the cost benefit. Um, sure. When we are, if in fact, we're, we're moving forward. Well, it's not only for the aesthetic purposes, at least from where I sit, I'm, I'm now I got my engineer hat on. 
it's not just right. the aesthetic purposes, it's protecting the gates from the elements as well, so they last longer. Whereas if they're outside and exposed, the, the, you know, they are gonna rust, um, they are gonna rust faster. So um, I, I, I would also, um, obviously we're not gonna make any kind of decision here, but I think uh, it would probably also uh, be good to afford the public an opportunity to provide some input on this, maybe at a good, at a good and welfare. Um, you know, they should have some, uh, uh, some input on this as, as well. Um, obviously that's not tonight. So, uh, maybe at a council meeting or something, uh, they can come up. Yep. Mike. Um, thank you, Tom. Um, the questions I have are President Bendo answered it. If you don't see it, you don't know it's there. But if you have a you know six feet of plywood, um, it sticks right in your face. And the ASAC is is good. I I would just ask my fellow council members before anything is decided going forward for the entire whatever that we get a chance to look at the prototype of what you're thinking and others are thinking of doing. So we can understand it before it goes up there, and then we find out. We can do that. We can build. We can build something in my shop. We'll we'll mock something up, a finished product, so we can set something up where everybody can come down and see exactly what it's going to look like before it goes on the board. Like I, I can do that. Thank you, Tom. And the other, which we can't do right now because it sounds too expensive, is. A, a fluid type of look similar to the current railing that may be for you know future years but if this is a need long term i mean year one year five that's something we may think about but thank you um that's all i have john okay uh, what i will say is that we did take into consideration the cost um, when we knew that we needed to put the uh the gates up we took in consideration the cost of the gate and to um to have everything done in house versus having a company and then giving us these elaborate gates that at this point and probably for the next five years, we won't be able to afford to do. Um, but I agree, we will make sure that there's a prototype after the five years is up, five or 10 years is up that we can show a prototype of what needs to be put up there. Um, just not, everybody needs to be aware. It's not just for large parties that go out it's also if we ever have another pandemic and we have to close down for any reason whatsoever, we have to be ready. Okay, uh, just uh, this is a, just a minor detail. Uh, Tom, do we, Tommy, do we have uh, um, like extra Ipe wood lying around that you could cap these things with so it matched the boardwalk? I have some, but not nearly enough to do to do that to cap okay it. okay yeah. all right all right anyone else uh got any questions on this no thank you tommy you're welcome thank you guys all right thanks tommy you're welcome uh okay let's see what time is it anyway all right 806 uh, all right, let's let's keep going. How about um, oh yeah, uh, let's talk about uh, a little bit about uh, Tuesday's council meeting. Um, you know, we've been trying to get back to doing live meetings. I mean, obviously, uh, the last meeting when we had switched over to Zoom that that was a leap forward from the old system under WebEx where people were submitting questions and writing in advance. And then we were taking a lot of time uh, putting together answers and writing. Um, you know, Zoom kind of made it so we could take live questions and uh, live good and welfare. So that was a big step forward. And then I guess we were hoping to maybe migrate. We even had talked about it for potentially for this meeting uh, but migrating to back to live meetings. But now the governor has extended the
the executive order through October. Uh, I don't know if that's in anticipation of him thinking our numbers are going to start spiking because they are around much of the other country and the and the the flu season and the the, the colder weather might cause the numbers to spike. Um, but technically, we could still hold a meeting that has a maximum of 50 people. Uh, today, the city manager and uh, John and I and uh, and Rich were in the chamber trying to figure out some logistics. If we were to do a live meeting, how many people could we fit in there? How would we make it work? Um, the problem is uh, we can probably only get, if you count, take staff out of it, um, staff and the council out of it. We're probably limited to about 25 people that could attend a meeting. So that, of course, raises an issue of how do you decide who those 25 are? Is it first come, first serve? Do we do a lottery? Um, so there's that issue. The other issue is we only have one functioning elevator in City Hall, and there's not supposed to be more than two people at a time in it. Um, so that's going to create issues getting the people up to the chamber. Then there's the um, uh, protocols for if somebody comes up to a mic to speak, then we have to have somebody there that's going to sanitize or wipe down the mic afterwards. That now means we have to have staff in there on overtime. I assume that means then we also have to be sanitizing the elevators and the bathrooms uh, up on the sixth floor uh, during the course of the meeting as people are using them. Um, the, also, all the, the, the pews where people will be sitting would have to be sanitized. Again, that's staff and overtime. So um, I guess the question comes for Tuesday that we need to think about is we seem to have Zoom seems to have solved a lot of the issues where people can participate live. Um, so that's a good thing. Yeah, it still doesn't necessarily place being in a room face to face, but there's still quite a few logistical challenges. Uh, probably the foremost being how do you decide if you got 50 people that want to come in and we can only fit 25, how do you decide who gets in? Um, plus, there's actually going to be a cost to the city for the overtime for those people that have to do the cleaning and the sanitizing um, throughout the course. So I guess it beckons a question of should we, um, at least for Tuesday, and then it gives us a little time to see how things migrate uh, for the for the what would be the first meeting of October, but um, uh, should we should we try to do live or should we stick with with Zoom? Um, One of the things you have to keep in mind is that if you do live, you as you said, you are maxed out at twenty five people. If you do Zoom, you can reach a bigger population of the city yeah. that can ask questions. Um, because they can ask questions through Zoom. So we can we can ask more than 25 can see because if we do it live, we won't be taking, well, we won't be taking questions, written questions either way, but more people can be involved uh, via Zoom than if we did it live. And one of the other things, um, because Mike came in also today and we talked about if someone comes in and there, we put, let me go back. In the chamber on the pews, we put stickers to say where you should sit to be six feet apart. However, we didn't take into consideration if two people in the same household comes and they sit, that throws the whole schematic off because you have to be six feet apart. Um, it was suggested that we ask people to who come in in uh, two or more to sit in the back so we don't throw the schematic off. We do every other row. Um, so again, as you said, we have some challenges that we really have to kind of work out. Yeah. Yeah, John and Donna, I did, I, I would really like to until I was 
looking at the layout today of what it would look like if we move to a open meeting. John Bendo described the um, everything or the problems with the cleaning, cleansing, microphone, the layout. There's also, as you enter the building, whatever time it is, you have to get your temperature checked and you have to be logged in. And there's, there's it's a very labor intensive process, which is costly. So as much as I would love to see it, I don't think we can, my only opinion is knowing I'd like to, I don't think it's possible at this point, but, um, but Donna, thank you for allowing me to stop in later on earlier today, just to see the effort that went in to try to make it happen. And I, and the elevators and everything else, but that's my Well, Mike, thanks for coming in because you actually brought up a couple of things that we hadn't even discussed, um, making sure that things were sanitized uh, on a regular basis. Um, so thank you for stopping by. Anyone else, uh, Liz? So uh, we only did the Zoom one time with the public. So it, I think we could try give it another shot which we would give at this time, people would have more information that we are actually doing a Zoom where before maybe they just thought it was WebEx again and we would be reading into for the record, so-and-so asked a question and you'll find it up on the website. This way, now, now that they have more, more time, they'll know that instead of going to City Hall, I'm going to go to Zoom. And most people have a smartphone. You can download the, the app and do it that way. I'm saying that we're, let's just give it another try for the month of September. And let's see if the governor lifts the rule, then we go back and when then we go back in October. Yeah, I mean, um, well, Roy Lust is probably watching right now. He could, he could, speak in his pajamas, I guess, uh, at, at, at Good and Welfare if he wanted. Yeah, and it gives everyone the opportunity to speak. I've been in, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that we've all been in Zooms. I've been in a Zoom class with 150 people. It's, it's manageable once you get to know the programming and people learn how to use their computer a speaker view versus everybody's on the screen at once or everyone is just one big head. All right, Karen, Scott, you got any thoughts or? I have a question. Um, when you were outlining uh, the amount of people that are allowed to be in the chamber, does that take into account, for example, if I'm applying for a parking variance, do I come out of the number of people who would be there who want to uh, watch a meeting or speak and go on welfare, or is that a separate pool? Do I eat into the 25 or 50 people? No, we, we assumed, um, we assumed the five council members, the corp council, the city manager, and about five other staff that would come in to typically to speak on the various resolution items. Um, okay. So, you know, there was, we, we estimated, you know, around 12 uh, on that. And then the, the space, because remember, we're not, we can't all be up on the dais. So what we would have to have is uh, the layout was probably going to be something along the lines of three people up on the dais, uh, one in the middle, one on either end, uh, Dave in his usual spot, kind of at that middle level. And then we'd have to put uh, uh, some of the council members then down at the floor level, but they would have then have to be far enough away from the podium. So if people came up to the podium to speak, they're not within six feet of each other. So because of doing that, that eliminated the use of the first row of, of the seats because that was too close then to the council members. So once you started laying it out, it, it, it turned out we could probably get 
about 25 people. So my question would be, out of those 25, if number two on the agenda that night was parking variance for whatever spot, and I'm the person applying for the parking variance, am I out of that 25, or is it a separate number, or am I taking okay. somebody else's spot? You're included in that 25. And okay. so just so you know, um, John, when Mike and I went up, we actually, you were going to lose probably the first two, first two to first three rows, because when you put the podium in the middle, nobody can be sitting on the end because who's ever speaking has to be six feet from the person sitting on the pew. Um, so we had, to, we would really have to redo how the pews are set up and where we're putting the podium. Right. And the other issue, I guess, is if somebody comes in to speak on a, whether it's a resolution item or go to welfare, I guess, like, you really can't say to them, okay, you had your chance to speak on item two on the agenda. So you have to leave. So somebody could come in and speak at good and welfare. In other words, technically, it's an open meeting, you couldn't just say to someone, you, you already spoke once, you need to leave to make room for someone else. That's we really, I don't know if there's a legal basis to do that. So once the 25 or so people were in, that's really it. It's not like we could cycle people through. Well, I guess if people decided to leave on their own as a courtesy, but we have no guarantee people would do that um, because they may want to speak on multiple agenda items and good and welfare. So um, again, that creates... Uh, more limitations on us. All right. Well, uh, all right. So I, I guess I'll speak with the the, the city it's manager. City manager. I know when, when. I mean, there's no way we can. There's no winning in this. But there will be more residents able to have their voice listen to on a zoom call or a zoom meeting whatever you want to call it then coming to city council and the chamber and having your temperature taken and then you know people talk about big brother i'm taking your temperature and now you're say so you have a temperature now you're yeah no uh, yeah it would it would allow more people to participate a, a Zoom call, at least given the limitations we have right now. That is true. Um, I mean, like I said, it'd be nice to get back to some normalcy of the live meetings, but there'd be a lot of limitations on what we could do. Because uh, there's also some equipment limitations on, uh, we're not even sure we have all the microphones or wireless mics we need to spread them out uh, where people would be sitting. Um, so that, that's that's another issue. So, Mike, you put your hand up. Uh... Um, yeah, I. Oh, on if we go to Zoom, which we're doing now, would that allow when we get into Good and Welfare, fifty or hundred people? Would more people be possibly on a Zoom call than like twenty five at a meeting? So Zoom would probably be better. Well, Zoom doesn't, uh, it depends on our license. I mean, some- We have a limit licenses. of 100. Okay, so Zoom, our current license has, lets us go up to 100 participants, right. which clearly is more than we would be able to get in the chamber. Right, um, okay. Uh, you know, you can get Zoom licenses that go up to much higher numbers uh, as, as well. Um, but uh, yeah, clearly more people would be able to participate via Zoom right now so all right uh i think the writing's on the wall on this one but i'll talk with this city manager in the morning and uh, i guess we'll make a final decision on how we're going to proceed um uh, so uh oh i'm i'm sorry are we finished with the boardwalk beach update john i just wanted to no, well, we're going to go with that to later on. Uh, if there's yeah, there's, if there's more to talk about, we can certainly do that. Yeah. So no, I just uh, have a general question that I just thought of, and I don't know. Um, 
Uh, why, why don't we hold off then? Because I, I I know the chief's on. So when when he starts talking, um, and, oh, and and Joe's here too. So I, I assume that means we'll be talking about that. So why don't we save it for then? How about um, uh, another topic of interest? I guess uh, Airbnbs, and uh, that's what Ray. Do, Ray yeah, What what are we doing with them? Um, Hi. Good evening. Uh, Council. Uh, so, city manager asked me to look into Airbnbs and possibly how can we tax them and get a cut of the revenue. Uh, so, I looked into pretty much what's happening across the country and mostly in New York State. And every municipality is having the same issue pretty much. What do we do? Uh, it, there's zoning issues. Uh, is, is a rental an illegal basement apartment? Is it taking up an actual rental? Uh, and also there's issues with our own existing laws that I have noticed as well. Um, on the New York State Law 1202, New York State Tax Law, that codifies all municipalities within New York State to collect the hotel occupancy tax or an occupancy tax, which is a broader tax, which applies to all rooms for hire. Uh, in 1965, the city of Long Beach uh, passed section 124, which is the hotel occupancy tax in the city, but it appears that our hotels in the city do not collect that tax, uh, possibly because it was never codified by New York State. Uh, our hotels are relatively new in the past, but 10 years or so. It was, it was uh, budgeted, it was budgeted years ago and we tried to collect it, but yeah, it was never codified by the state, so there's no, I think, legal authority. I believe Corporation Council is going to have to look further into that. Uh, so that's a possible revenue stream moving forward. And we could also update the law to make it an occupancy tax. So if and when we want to get to short-term rentals, we can include them in that. Also, we should do it so the treasurer or the comptroller collects the revenue, not the state or the county. Uh, there's eight other cities right now that have been codified and they have their fiscal officer collecting the fees, not the state. Uh, so they can keep track of it. Um, I think the city of Beacon was recently almost, pa almost passed a law, but they voted it down. Um, you know, there's, you know, how do we, can we tax uh, something that's an illegal use? So that's a big legal question. Uh, I think corporation council has to look into. Um, also, if we do legalize it, there's the zonings, there's the neighbors, uh, the safety inspections that hotels have, that's also an issue. Uh, it, it's, it's, there's a lot and all municipalities across the country are having issues and some municipalities when they try to pass laws, uh, Airbnb's lawyers come right in and the litigation and that, that drives up the cost to even try to collect a little bit of tax. Um, I don't know. That's pretty much what I found. Uh, any questions? Well, I think the first thing I heard is we got to get, uh, whether this is our corp council office or whoever we do it, but sounds like we need to get on our state senator and assembly person to get the state to approve the occupancy tax so we can start collecting that from the, uh, from the hotels. Yeah, we have to do that and also update our law as well. Okay. Well, what, right. Whatever we need to do, but uh, yeah, we need to start doing that. I mean, anybody that travels for business knows you always uh, occupancy taxes are common occurrence. Um, in some places, they are also ridiculously high too. Uh, I think New York City is yeah. one of them. But um, so, but but so then Donna, can, we go yeah. ahead can we go ahead with that? Well, that's what I'm saying. Um, we need. Yeah, Dad, right. I, think so. I talked to Donna earlier, and that's something everyone's on board on looking into and going ahead and correcting. Great. Okay. And so then that brings, I guess, uh, the the Airbnbs them, themselves. Um, I mean, you can go on Airbnb's website and see where the properties are. It's no secret. Uh, um, yeah, I was able to identify about half of them just by what pictures they had. Some people yeah. put the front of their house with the number. Others, it was a little bit more research. 
Right. So um, if I understand correctly, technically Airbnbs are illegal the way our charter is written right now. So anybody oh, doing yeah, it is – right. So anybody doing – right. So anybody doing it right now is doing something illegal. That being said, we know there's quite a – there's a number of people out there doing it and have been for quite some time. So I guess – the, the initial issue at hand is, okay, you know, I think the city's been kind of looking the other way to some degree or hasn't been doing a lot of enforcement on that. Um, question is, do you keep it illegal and start enforcing or do you just say you can't stop it? It's going to happen, but so reg I'm regulate it, you know. I ask a question. We're we're specifically talking about Airbnb, and there are other names. Well, it's VRBO as well, Verbo right. and others. It's not just Airbnb. So yeah, if I'm a, I get my house and I put it up on that website, then I should be kicking into the city some some change. Is that our goal? Possibly. But you, you <laughs> have to. Well, well, to raise raise point, to but raise point, you, it, you, we would have to legalize it. It's not legal right now. Right. Well, I don't say that. so we would we're looking to legalize Airbnb, which would be good for a. Uh, and I'm I'm going back in history. I'm just thinking. I remember why there was a we made not we but. The city had a big issue in the summertime with group rentals for some, and I know in the West End there were 30 people at one time in a house. Uh, I, I, think it, I, think it's a, I think it's a big leap right now to say we're ready to make uh, be, be or make these legal. That, yeah. that, we're, okay. not, we're not ready to do that. Right. No, we're that, not. Uh, that there question. are about... <laughs> 15 counties through like upstate that are taxing them, uh, but not the local municipalities. So the, the revenue is going to the county, even though the Airbnb is generally probably considered illegal in, in those local municipalities, but the counties are collecting taxes on them. And there are uh, companies that work with Airbnb and just get all the revenue like Airbnb every month hands over a check and they don't give any data where the money is coming from, what the occupancy levels they just give based on what revenue they collect. And they, believe, it has worked out for those municipalities, the, uh, I the believe, counties. I believe, I, believe, I believe there's a property management company right on Beach Street in the West End um, near near New York. Uh, no, this I found like a, more of a national co company that does it. Mm -hmm. Like much like we have the uh, foreclosure registry, they do. They'll help with laws and do stuff like that uh, as well. Pretty much the same thing, but for the short-term rentals. So, so, so for next steps, I'd love to see the research on the counties upstate and see what sort of revenue they collect and what sort of uh, rules they have in their uh, code. Okay, that can be done. Jumping for just one second. Just so to we... answer Liz's uh, question, we actually have been prosecuting more of them in the thirty-person house. I believe we actually we just recently prosecuted. Rich can probably elaborate a bit more, but we have been prosecuting more of them recently. So, right. Um, so transient occupancy is what, what the code kind of talks about. It's anything less than thirty days, and so our building department with our zoning inspector. Um, goes out and issues summonses and violations for that, and we prosecute those in city court. The trouble, um, and actually it's funny because uh, my colleague, the illustrious Mr. Lupo, made a good point um, offline to me, is that essentially you can't, you can't catch someone in the act unless someone reports it because it's not illegal to advertise an Airbnb. It's illegal to rent it. So we're kind of at the mercy of the goodwill of the bad will of your neighbor in that regard. So as terms of enforcement, it, it really depends on what the community does in terms of reaching out to the building department or the police department to say, hey, someone's renting an Airbnb here and there's an absolute you know, crazy party going on. There's 50 people in this house and I'm, I'm losing my mind because I have work in the morning. Um, 
So to that end, you know, I wouldn't say the burden's on the community, but if, 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 you, need, if you need enforcement or if something's bothering you, you know for a fact there's an Airbnb, call the cops, uh, call the police, call, call the building department if it's during daytime hours and someone will go there and inspect and we'll so cite them. Is that the procedure, I'm sorry to jump in. Is that the procedure, Rich? So, sorry, I, I live next to a home because over the course of the summer, you hear, you know, you'll get an email, my neighbor is having a party, but that's different than my neighbor is never here and there are new people in the house every week. And so they should be calling the building department first? Is that? So it, it all depends. And that's a, what you asked is kind of a circumstantial question. All these different things arise in different ways. So what might start out as a noise complaint from you, Liz, or from your neighbor may very well turn into an Airbnb prosecution. Because essentially what happens is, is at night, someone's throwing a party, they're disturbing the place. Someone calls the police, the police respond. And if, if the police get a sense after interviewing the people at the house that something's afoot, they call the zoning inspector uh, to come and the zoning inspector shows up, you know, in the middle of the night, if he has to, does his investigation. And if, if you know, if there's probable cause or there's a reasonable suspicion that they've committed that crime, uh, as long as the day, you know, sure as the day is long, uh, we will prosecute the violation to the best of our abilities. Thank you. But when you say a neighbor has to report them, I mean, if we, if from an enforcement perspective, if somebody's advertising whatever, a room, uh, a bedroom, whatever, for two hundred dollars a night, and an investigator or enforcement officer of some kind goes on and books it, th that's you, they've broken the law. I guess the police used to call those what sting operations or. Remember the beach pass sale on uh, Craigslist. Yeah, that, that's good. I, and I'll just give you an interesting example. Before the meeting, I was I was looking online. There is a house on the bay in the West End that is being rented for five thousand dollars per night. And it says it's great for corporate events, for filming of movies or TV shows. It has six bedrooms. They will offer catering services to cater your corporate events. That's a commercial enterprise. That's not even a house anymore. That's a commercial enterprise. That requires the mercantile license. And, well, but, but that being said, what I'm saying is, is there is some real low hanging fruit out there if we're going to do enforcement. Uh, there was another place on the ocean side in the West End that was 2000 bucks a night. Sure. So, if, if you'd like to authorize a credit card for a sting operation, we'll book as many as you'd well, like. Well, what, but what I'm saying yeah. is, I mean, it's it's not hard to figure out, yeah. you know, how to do the enforcement. Um, I, I'm not a police officer, you know, so or, or an enforcement officer. So, I mean, I, I have to leave that to them. Right. But we know who's yeah. doing it. <laughs> right. To your point, John, I mean, there's a bunch of different options to take here. We can stay with the status quo and keep transient occupancy illegal and maybe ramp up our investigation or our, you know, our operation in terms of um, enforcing that law, or we can go the route of perhaps regulating it. Um, I know Jersey City took a step in regulating it not too long ago as well. So um, it'll be something I guess that the council will have to consider. Right, because here's, here's an issue to consider too. If you, if you legalize it and don't, let's say put a cap on a number of units, What's not to say we don't have 300 Airbnbs suddenly in the city, which now creates, uh, exasperates the parking issues. Um, uh, you know, then the, the, I, I'm not sure, again, would an Airbnb, what kind of inspection criteria there might be if they have to go through building inspections, fire inspections, you know, any kind of safety inspections um, and how that might impact the, the, the city um so th there's a there's a lot of questions we're clearly not answering them all here tonight i think we're just starting a conversation here tonight is all we're doing yes Scott. john um i just want to ask rich um don't we have a task force that is still in place at the police department that people can report anonymously if they believe whether it be airbnb or illegal rentals or what have you i believe we have a task force they could report anonymously 
this would fall under that as well. You familiar? I, if we still I have believe that you're plan? right, Scott. I'm not 100% sure if it's a dedicated task force, but I know that um, I've made a couple of complaints about some noisy neighbors at certain points, and I didn't give my name. Um, and they pretty much honor that during uh, when you call the desk and things like that. Um, so no, there was, um, I don't there know. Was, I'm not 100% sure about the task force. I think so. There was a separate task force. There's, and there was a separate anonymous number. Scott is correct. This okay. way, just unrelated, if anybody feels that the, whether it be an Airbnb or an illegal rental, they shouldn't feel as if they have to uh, put themselves or their family in jeopardy if they're making a legitimate complaint that's going to be investigated. So maybe we can make that um, on our website uh, just to remind people. Good. The number still um, exists. The number still exists. Um, and so we can bring that out. We can put that out on the website. Um, if whatever you want to report, um, without giving your name, this is the number you call. Right, yeah, Scott, you're, you're right. And I, I remember um, when issues like that came up, uh, the building inspector, Rich Shue, would go out and he was usually called out on Friday nights, Saturday nights when, when these events happened. One person or one person recommended or asked, just to your point, how can I call or email or report it anonymously so my like next door neighbor doesn't know I called in on them, that type of thing. So that's something that if it exists, I'd like to, uh, you know, the, either the phone number or the email would be great. All right. Well, like I said, we're not, we're certainly not going to resolve this tonight. I think the idea is just to, uh, get the get the discussion going uh I'm, again i'm sure the public has some uh, strong thoughts on this as well um since this is can be a uh, on some blocks can be a quality of life issue uh if, if there's lots of rentals and again it's it's taking up parking spots and things like that um and but then for some people it's also the flip side of that coin is it's supplemental income they may need to keep their home so um, there's there's a there's a lot to unpack on this issue, and uh, so we're going to need some data and uh, and then uh, start start coming up with uh, what's in the best interest of the city. So, um, like I said, we're not going to resolve it tonight, but I thought it was uh, something that's we we needed to at least get it out there and get the dialogue going because it's. It, it's been one of those, the, the elephant in the middle of the room that nobody talks about for a while now. We know it's out there. We know it's increasing, you know, and, uh, and quite frankly, Long Beach is getting more and more popular the last few years. So, um, and uh, uh, if you read articles about it, you see there's whole areas where uh, people are just swooping in and buying up properties to make them strictly short-term rentals and nothing else right. you know they don't they never intend to live in them and yeah you know i don't know if that's what we want the uh, long beach to become so if i could there was definitely a uh, karen and, and scott's recollection is spot on obviously um there was a dedicated number and email address for it i, I don't want to give it out right now because i just want to make sure that it's still active and goes somewhere before doing so. So okay. um, we'll confirm that in the morning or in the next couple of days. Um, the telephone number is still active. We are you know sure it is? Yeah, okay. because we gave it to somebody. <clears throat> okay. Okay. So that one, I'll give you that's 516-431-1000 extension 239. So right now we have several, that, that house in the West End that's going to be rented out for five grand a night, right? John? What's that? I'm sorry, what was that? We have a house in the West End that wants to rent for, and so here comes the other interesting thing is that um, I, I suppose there are real estate agents in this town that know about that. Uh, I'm sure, well, look, I mean, it, it's no secret that we have a real estate agents in the town who make a lot of money off of short-term rentals during the season. So maybe we should talk um, to the Chamber of Commerce about the fact that that our real estate agents 
are should not be advising short term rentals in this town anymore. Well, I, I, I think they know that already. I, it's just, uh, again, it's uh, enforcement. It's something that's just kind of, yeah, it's just kind of been, it's been there and, you know, they dabble doing something about it, but haven't really been serious. So I guess it's up for us to, us to decide if we're serious or not. Well, yeah, but like I said, there's a lot to unpack. I mean, this, this, this is a topic that could probably be a meeting all in up and of itself. Cause like I said, you know, uh, this probably should be before next season. Uh, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Cause like I said, it, it creates their, their quality of life aspects to this for the residents. So they, they should have a, uh, some input and, uh, you know, I, we, we'd probably have to see what financial impacts they could be going either way. So, um, but I don't know if the status quo is the way to continue because it's just, you know, like everywhere else, there's more and more, it's happening more and more and it's completely unregulated. And it's, it's some ways it's burdening the city uh, from a service perspective, because it's uh, again, more people parking, more uh, people on the beach. And um, there is a cost to the city and the city is, and cities and residents don't want their property taxes to increase. Well, yeah. So, all right. Because uh, in the interest of time, why don't we move on? Like I said, we could uh, certainly schedule uh, another conversation about this. Uh, Donna, can we get a, or Simone or whoever, can, or John, a uh, quick update on the MLK? That's Simone. Yep, sorry, trying to unmute. <laughs> okay, first, I would just say, I think we kind of did a little introduction, but I'd like to welcome Joseph Lupo to our office uh, as a new assistant corporation counsel. So I'll just start off with that. Then as a second matter, well, as an initial matter, I think it's necessary to clarify the current status of the building uh, with respect to reopening as there seems to be some misinformation circulating out there. So just to, to reiterate and just go over again. So in March, the city you know, ended up closing the building due to the governor's pours order and the building has remained closed to the public since March. You know, since it was never reopened, it couldn't have been recently shut down. So this seems to be some confusion as to that, that question. So the building is, is currently closed to the public because it has not been reopened yet. Um, as we're you know, aware, there are, there's two types of services that are generally provided in the building. It's recreational and educational. Uh, under the governor's reopening plan, uh, limited recreation was not permitted to reopen until phase four plus, as we're calling it, because it was a little bit later than phase four. Uh, and we didn't re-enter phase four until, we're at that point of phase four until mid to late August. You know, in addition, educational uses didn't start and reopen in Long Beach until this week. So I just, just want to make everybody aware and the public aware of that, because again, that seems to be some confusion. Um, in addition, in order to reopen, you must develop a site safety plan that is specific to the type of activity and use that's going to be going on in the building. So, you know, with this, it needs to be specific to the recreational types of uses and each use, if it's whatever it is, you know, one has to be authorized by the governor. So if it's football, for example, football's not yet authorized and might not be till September, October, or, it, or we don't know at this point, um, you know, but all of the uses have to be approved and permitted uses by the governor at this stage of the game. And, you know, the site safety plan needs to provide for each type of use. So it would apply to the recreational uses, every specific type, uh, and also to the educational, whatever educational uses would be, would be conducted and office also accommodate office use. So those are some things right there. I mean, and as we just, I think kind of all got from councilman Delore, the, he just explained a lot of the guidelines just from our building alone and how much goes into these, all these things that he noted are part of our site safety plan. So taking your temperature when you come in, signing in, keeping a log for tracing purposes, all those different types of things go into your site safety plan. So this isn't something that can just be done haphazardly. It also can't be generic uh, or general because we need to make sure we're accounting for each type of activity and keeping everyone safe and complying with the governor's guidelines. But I think safety is, is our 
you know, primary objective here. So just wanted to explain that in general, because as I said, there seems to be a lot of misinformation circle circling around. Uh, for every building we have, every use that we have going, the city has developed its own site safety plan specific to that use. So City Hall has its own, our farmer's market, the pools, the beach, and the boardwalk, and they've all been developed at different stages as we've reopened. So, you know, with all this in mind, going back a bit, you know, we had reached out to the MLK Center in late July, you know, anticipating that if we were going to go into these types of uses, it would probably be in late August to the beginning of September. And we wanted to discuss, you know, the next steps for reopening because we knew we were going to have all these requirements and also a new lease for the space as we have received inquiries from the uh, Nassau County Family Services Division, uh, basically for a new lease to ensure that the MLK Center continues to meet its requirements for its grant funding and in, you know, we are able to help them be in compliance. So as I said, we reached out to them. Uh, they, their board wasn't available to begin discussions until mid-August and city officials and the entire board did begin you know, discussions at that point. Uh, you know, the MLK board also committed to working on a programming schedule for discussions. So as I was saying, a programming schedule would include the types of activities so that we could better determine what kind of site safety plan, you know, we would need and help them with developing a site safety plan. So, you know, both parties agreed to continue discussions and schedule the subsequent meetings for late August. Um, you know, however, then the board did choose to request an adjournment uh, of our, our most recent meeting to seek legal assistance in, in moving through this process because it, you know, can be a little bit complicated. Uh, last Friday, late last Friday afternoon, we did receive a draft programming schedule and a generic site safety plan from the executive director. And uh, we're currently reviewing the materials and assessing the next steps as some of the programs proposed um, are not scheduled or it seems like are not scheduled to be considered for, reop for reopening until later this month or early October. Um, and in addition to that, the state safety plan is, is not specific to the types of use. So it, it's kind of a generic plan. So additional discussions are, are going to be necessary in order to work out those details and those kinks. Um, you know, and additionally, we're working on drafting a new lease agreement for a future use of facility to ensure that everyone is in compliance with certain requirements uh, and guidelines. And, that we're all being good stewards to the communities that we serve and making sure everybody's meeting their obligations and doing what they're supposed to do. So that's an update. Does anyone have any questions? Um, so my understanding is the lease has the current tenant there's one tenant right now, right? So, yes. and, that te and that tenant is, for, for lack of a better term, I guess on a holdover for the old lease, it expired, but a new lease was never done. So they just kind of operating under the old lease. So- um, Sort of, yes, but at this point, uh, pretty much for certain funding requirements, and I guess newer funding requirements with Nassau County, uh, there must be a current lease. So at this point, you know, it really is, it's necessary, one from our standpoint, as I mean, as you know, we are evaluating all of our facilities and all of our buildings, and we are making sure that they are all in compliance, that we have updated leases, uh, that the leases have been audited to ensure that they have the most favorable terms for the city. Um, and also this is part of just the general audit and overview, you know, overall audit that Ina is going through in my office and uh, working, you know, with some of the state comptroller's recommendations. So yes, yeah, so for multiple purposes, one also that we need to come into compliance and we also need to, to, to be doing what we should be doing and being accountable as this council has committed to doing. And also to help, I mean, they, Nassau County requires a current lease. So this also helps that not for profit as well. So when did the lease expire? The lease expired quite some time ago. Um, we're talking over a decade. 
It's been more than 10 years they've been without it's, a lease? It's been, yes, many more than 10 years. <laughs> been 25 years, John. Approximately, yeah, 25 years or 20, 25 years. And how, and how much are they paying in rent? Currently, they have not been paying rent, which Ina and I discovered as we were doing our review. So they got no lease and they haven't been paying rent. Precisely. How do you get grant money then? Oh, we're all working on making sure that everything gets fixed as soon as possible. Yes, and, and to your, your point, Councilman Delore, you do need to have a current lease in order to continue to receive your grant funding. So this is something that is a priority and should be a priority uh, for them as well, because they, you know, it's, it's a Nassau County requirement. I, I know over the years, things have changed, obviously things develop, but currently that is one of the requirements for their grant funding contract. I just or at least that's that what the county has, has advised us. Um, this, this is, a, this is, this is a, you know, an across the board process as Simone has explained. Donna and Simone and the, the entire staff have found, you know, inconsistencies <coughs> in terms of procedures and policies that that the city is not following. And, I'm, and we have, and this administration is cleaning them up. So there are going to be issues like this, Mike, where, yeah, there's inconsistencies between the policies and the applications that are going on right now. And we're fixing them all. This, this is what, this is what the staff is working on, fixing a lot of things. And this so, is one. Yes. Simone, do you happen to know when the last time they did pay rent was? I don't. Um, I don't recall whether Ina had looked into it or not. I, I think. I mean, Ina might be able to answer. I don't believe they paid rent for a significant amount of time. It's. It has to be at least ten years. I, I'm not sure if our if Ina was able to do an accounting specifically. It just. It hasn't been any time recently. <laughs> but so, I guess we could say that. So you were saying yeah, that uh, to, to, get, <clears throat> to get their grant money and such, they have to submit financial information to the, I guess the state you would said. I'm assuming they would have to file similar information with the city since they're a tenant in our building running programs. Uh, do they submit financial information to the city? Yes, you are correct. They, under the old lease and then anything going forward, they are required to file their um, annual returns, which is a 990 because they are not for profit. And also um, their char 500s, which their char is their annual filing with New York State um, Charities Division, I believe it is. Uh, so yes and no, we have not, you know, I'm not sure whether or not they have gotten an extension for this year. The most recent that we do, or at least we were able to obtain through, you know, the state websites, because they do have them available. We weren't provided them with them from the not-for-profit. So that's the start. We were able to, you know, pull them from their published on state websites after a certain period of time. So we were able to pull the 2018 um, I know that that Ina has some questions about it, and we also had asked that their treasurer, you know, please reach out to Ina, um, and so that Ina could talk about some of the questions and comments and concerns that she has. So, and and we're awaiting them. We're awaiting that basically their treasurer to respond. So that's pretty much the status right now. We're waiting to hear back, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. and I think I think I cut Ina off. She was going to say something. <laughs> You didn't cut me off, no. I just wanted to uh, say that um, Simone is absolutely right. Um, I don't think that there has been any collections on the rent in the last 10 years. Okay. <sighs> yes, All I mean, right. and we have an obligation just as the city, you know, to be good stewards, as I said, and to make sure a couple of things, you know, that they're they're properly funded to be in our building for a purpose and for services. Uh, as I said too, I mean, we have to make sure that they're 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 abiding by all of the guidelines and restrictions for reopening. 
Um, you know, and, and further discussions are definitely required for that. And we're awaiting a lot of information. Okay. Yeah. Well, it sounds like now you're, you're having dialogues with their board. So, um, I, I guess we got to get this straightened out. Mike, Mike. I'm just a general question, Simone, if you know this, and if not, the utilities that are like water, um, electric lighting, um, would they be in the city's name because we own the building? I believe they are. Ina might know better. I think they are in our name because um, I don't believe there's separate meters in the building. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't okay. know if Ina knows the, the actual answer. To that I was going to say, Ina should building. know that answer, and I believe they are in the okay. name. Okay. And any type of usual uh, improvements uh, to building, whether it's uh, you know, a roof or whatever type of structural improvements or knocking down a wall or improving the fire alarm system or anything like that, that would usually need us as the owner to do. And if we have to expend money, can we build the tenant? Under the provision, under the old lease, yes, we do have the right to do that. Uh, for starters, they're supposed to, if it's a non-structural issue, they are actually supposed to do all the repairs themselves and the obligation is on them. If it's a okay. structural repair, then it would be our cost. So for example, I believe Tommy, at one point we, we looked at the facility to just figure out what was there because I guess there's been some work that's been done that we didn't necessarily do over the years. So I know Tommy had talked about some work that was done by us under FEMA after Sandy, but that was to the roof, it was structural. So we were on the hook for right. that. But it's my understanding that we're still paying for most everything in the building, even though it, it technically is their responsibility. Okay, thank you. Oh, I just want to bring up that, you know, even though I'm a put paper pusher, this is giving me a headache. Um, Liz, um, uh, you know, the bigger <laughs> issue here is that we have, we have uh, services that, may, that used to be provided, but that are not necessarily being provided right now. And I'm really concerned about that. Have you been talking with you know, your fellow nonprofit um, uh, friends in the community to see how we can serve uh, or help with services? Well, um, we're y yes, but um, we're I am optimistic that things will be moving forward and getting back to normal. And, and, and Donna, you've been touched with uh, members of the community, right? Like. Pastor. Yes, actually what we're doing is we're looking at all of the buildings that the city owns that mm -hmm. can be rented out or services can be provided. We're going to come up with an application. And so if you, and Simone can explain this too. So if you want to use the MLK Center for holding a class, a STEAM program, you can come to the city and say, I want to hold STEAM program at MLK. But if you want to hold the same program on a different date somewhere else in one of the other city buildings, you will have that right. And so we're trying to make sure that the services that are provided are provided for Long Beach as a whole. And so because it is a city building and we're trying to keep our own city out of hot water of saying that this building is only allocated for this and nothing else can be in that um, because it's all taxpayers that pay for that building. Um, and we're trying to do everything across the board. Um, and there have been, and McNally can speak about it. They had a meeting um, yesterday to talk about how to, um, do, how to do the services across the board um, in all the buildings that we have. And I know that that's something that everybody's been trying to work on it. You want to touch base about your meeting yesterday, Mr. McNally? Sure. I mean, it's we <clears throat> we brought together and we're looking to continue to expand a number of our faith-based and community slash civic leaders to, to really begin a discussion about um, how do we begin to assess the needs of the individual communities and the community writ large um, uh, across Long Beach. And then from there, um, you know, how do we how do we speak with the community and engage the community on what are the, the resources and the programs that um, and part of the discussion was not so much what they want, 
but what our community really needs um, to make sure that uh, our youth um, are having enrichment, life building, skills burning, skills building experiences that our that our seniors, um, you know, are getting the kind of the engagement and mobility and and um, you know the brain exercise for for lack of better terms work, um, and that these these programs are. Um, meeting the needs of, yes, the specific communities, because there is no denying that the West End is most likely to be utilized mostly by West Enders um, and North Park is most likely to be the community that utilizes MLK, but also with a recognition that these are citywide facilities. And so that we also diversify some of the opportunities that take place in each of the communities so that we are bringing, um, you know, the, the very diverse nature of our city together um, to be sharing use of some of these spaces in whatever ways that we can and the opportunities that we can create there. So that was the beginning of an opportunity. We'll be having you know, a, a follow-up discussion about how we conduct needs assessments. We're gonna be working on you know, what surveys might look like uh, for the communities um, and you know, the different ways that it can be dispersed because obviously just putting up a poll on the city's website um, is not doing a whole lot to bridge any sort of digital divide and you're not going to get, you know, from um, as much input from low mod communities or from an elderly population. And these are communities that we really, you know, want to be gaining their input on. So, um, you know, there's going to be some boots on the ground door knocking uh, at each of these centers. There might, they might become polling stations where I drop a survey off here. Um, so, you know, I think we came up with some pretty good, you know, in, in, intuitive or, um, you know, interesting ideas of how to move this stuff forward and how to try and get public input in ways that we haven't, the city hasn't historically done that. Um, and we'll keep moving forward until, you know, we're able to do so. So I'm, I'm hearing important. that. I'm sorry, Karen. I just wanted to say what's important for everybody to know, to know is that we're not talking about um, removing the current tenant from the building. That's why we're talking to the board. We're trying to get the lease. So I don't want anyone to think that as we move forward, we're saying we're kicking the current tenant out. That is not, that is not what we're doing at all. We're trying to be a partnership and see what else we can do in that particular building and have the tenant there. And that's why we're trying to work through the lease. And, and that was very much part of the conversation of the meeting last night too. So thanks for bringing that up, Donna. It was, you know, there are, the, the three separate community centers that we have, and it's West End, it's Magnolia, and it's Martin Luther King Center. Um, it, it's, they are utilized to varying degrees. You know, the West End Community Center is basically for some civic meetings, um, our, our sandbox program, and that's essentially it. The senior center has been used almost exclusively for senior plus um, our, our historical daycare program. Uh, the Martin Luther King Center is more the Junior King Center um, it is more robustly utilized by the nonprofit there. So it would be looking to supplement the work that they're doing insofar as, um, you know, what they're doing and making sure that it's complementary and not duplicative as well. You know, I've been to a lot of city council meetings and if this is a, and the most that I've heard about talking about actually um, working, um, utilizing all of our resources and then mapping them to the needs of the various sectors of the community. So this is a, you know, a great approach and a lot of work, but um, I think we're going to get um, a lot of results from it. So thank you. Sure. And, Do you uh, have any other questions or you want us to look into anything else? Well, it sounds like things are moving in the right direction. So there's, uh, it sounds like there's an, a needs assessment going on, which is a good thing. Yeah. I guess we're, we're fixing past faux pas on the, the tenant issue. Um, and then uh, hopefully bring in uh, the services the community needs to the various uh, buildings. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I, yeah, I just, uh, we'll have to be kept abreast of what's going on and, uh, but it's a good job all around, you know, this is how, this is how the departments work together. All right. Uh, we're running late here, but, uh, 
we've uh, had uh, the chief and uh, Mr. Brand there uh, sitting there patiently. So why don't we uh, hear about, uh, we'll get the, uh, the post-op, I guess, on the, the beach, the boardwalk, uh, the beach park, and uh, what we're doing for this month too, since it's uh, not going to be a uh, traditional September. I think we lost Mr. Brand. <laughs> He's asleep. He uh, to... Either that or he tried to unmute and disconnected himself. John, John, have we looked in, uh, do you know if we've looked, we reviewed leases, buildings, operations, things I like that. Muted. Oh, I'll let Paul go, okay. So, and I will just say, I'm sorry, Chief, before you, you jump in here, um, I just, we had assumed that the conversation that had taken place around the boardwalk and the beach um, had taken place. So I let those gentlemen know that they could get back to their families. Yes, um, so, you know, some of them chose to stick around, kudos to them, but way above and beyond. Um, it's a long two hours waiting here. <laughs> but you, you go, Chief, you earned it. Uh, what would you like to know about the new headquarters? Uh, I'm psyched to, to get it. You know, it's been uh, uh, coming for the, for the, uh, coming Paul, for the last four or five. That would be nice. That would be nice. What's, what's going on with the new headquarters? Uh, I don't know, other than uh, they're supposed to bring it in, I guess, in the middle of October. Uh, you know, at that point, I guess we need the cameras and the lights and the uh, action there because we uh, want to make sure nothing happens to it. Uh, we're going to need a new radio system, but uh, we don't want to go in there with the one we have now because the shot has been around since uh, Sandy, you know, which is a while. Uh, let me see what else you guys, what else would, you know, we, we were asking about equipment here and uh, we do need uh, a few things, not too bad. The trucks are in good shape and because uh, uh, we take care of them. Uh, uh, the jet, we need a jet ski and we need what they call a, a Mahundru, which we have two of them on the beach that now we had to give them out to the uh, officers on the beach because they deliver equipment in the morning. And the trailers are shot that we have. Uh, quads are in good shape. We just have uh, just received two new ones, uh, thanks to the city. Totally appreciate it. Uh, let me see what else you would. Uh, uh, yes, you know what the big thing is? It's the, uh, for years we've had these same chairs. We had two, uh, two chairs built by uh, the garage a while back. But the, uh, we're, we're probably going to have to replace 10 chairs. And where I will show them to uh, the people when I take them out and put them uh, in storage. Uh, uh, we tried cutting them in half, which I think works. Uh, but we'll have to see and uh, we'll have to get with some people with, that are good welders. We do have a, a, a young man that was a lifeguard that uh, now works for the sim that did all the welding for us. Uh, this previous uh, spring, uh, so we could use him if we want to uh, save a little money and, and cut the chairs down in half and try to uh, make them work for another year. But uh, we're definitely in the in the uh, uh, we need the chairs. We need the uh, I'd say we need approximately about six of them right now at this point. Uh, uh, anything else you would like to know about the uh, the beach or the uh, uh, what we're doing, uh, we're staying open. Well, I guess just for I, I assume most people know, but just for those that maybe don't, that the life the current plan is to have the lifeguards man the beaches uh, for the, at least the next couple of weekends, weather permitting, right? We're going to do it till the twenty seventh, supposedly, but we have to see how the weather is too. Right. Uh, so we're going to go the uh, 11th and 12th, 18th and 19th, excuse me, 19th and uh, 20th and 26th and 27th will be uh, be our last day on the beach there, Yom Kippur. So uh, we will continue to be there and uh, do the best we can. Uh, do we know, I am asking you guys a question, do we know about the governor's rule now about uh, what we're going to do like with volleyball and everything because he wants the same uh, standard held. 
I'm going to say that's a Mr. McNally question. Yeah, it's the same. <laughs> whether the beach is open or closed, the same rules apply. The same rules apply. Okay. Uh, I would put out there, uh, if we could get it on, on social media, about, uh, uh, you know, that the, everybody has to go by the state law, the state rules that the governor has put out, and by the Nassau County uh, beach rules, because we'll have some people that think there's because, uh, you, you know, the beach is closed. Uh, now we have lifeguards in the stand that they could do what they want. So I think on social media, that would help us a little bit. We could put some kind of lingo up there to uh, tell the people that you st we still have rules on the beach, even though we're here after the, uh, the season, so to speak. Uh, we will, we will reinforce that. That was, that was part of the messaging that um, went out when we first communicated that we were going to continue great. to have lifeguards on duty, but um you know, reinforcing messaging is, is definitely always a thing. So appreciate that, Chief. Okay. Uh, yeah, anything else uh, you would like to know about the beach? Mike? Mike okay. Um, yeah, Paul, sorry to keep you up past, you know, this late uh, <laughs> evening. <laughs> okay. Uh, the communication system you answered. Now, the communication system in the future that you're talking about, is that currently tied into uh, fire department, EMS, uh, police? You're all on one common. We band? we have yeah yeah we have a system now that is tied into all the all the uh, you know you got the police department, the fire department, and us, and uh, we're all together. That's how come uh, it's more like a team, you know. So we have to get a whole new system. The radios are dying on us, so we have to get what's called the repeater too, so we can. Bagney, it works a lot better going back and forth to east and west, so we cover everybody. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll see how it goes from there. So are your you individual units old? Yeah, they're very old. Yeah, they all need to be replaced. Okay. okay. Now, uh, I was going to ask Donna, but I, I'll ask her another time about the uh, the money we could be getting because she – will be in charge of that, and uh, I will get it on another date with her when I speak to her. Right, yeah. You answered all the questions I had in advance about equipment, okay. how was it? And then the weekends, I know people had asked one question. I don't know if this is for you or Donna or Joe Brandt about the beach passes. So when people come down on weekends, there are no ticket takers. It's just uh, – and do you have enough staffing for lifeguards to cover beaches? We have uh... – as I was telling Dada, we had about we have about sixty three that are back, uh, so we should be all right. You need about forty eight. We pulled one chair out down in Azores to compact it a little bit. That'll be a surfing beach then down there. So there's only one chair on that beach, and the next one will be a Pacific and going west. All those chairs will be up. So we'll have a full staff on for the people uh, that come down. Okay. Thank you, Chief. That's all my question. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, anything, anything else? Anyone else for the chief? No, have a good evening. Thank you. Have Thanks. a good evening, thank chief. You. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you. Uh, Thanks. Jo Joe, you got any uh, words of wisdom about the beach park and the boardwalk? <laughs> Joe's muted. Yeah, he's got to do it. Yeah. Hey, guys, how are you? I'm sorry, are we talking to me? No, 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 Joe Brand. Hey. Wrong Joe. <laughs> how, am I, how am I doing now? There you go. I'm here. Uh, <laughs> I, didn't have as, I didn't have as much luck as far as uh, employees to staff any of the beach entrances um, for the, for the postseason here. Um, I'm not necessarily sure that it's something that we need to do. Uh, most of the decisions we made with regard to extending the season were uh, in the realm of public safety. Um, Chief Gillespie told you what, what his numbers look like and, and the fact that he was able to, uh, to staff all the beaches. So I think it's a, a tremendous, tremendous uh, boom for the city that we can offer this. Uh, I give credit to the people that made the decision to look into it. It's never been done before. So, uh, anything we can do to ensure people uh, leaving the beach that enter the beach is is, is always good uh, in our best interest. 
I think there were some questions earlier with regard to recreation. Uh, I mean, real briefly, I think most of you know the rec uh, weight room and the municipal pool uh, are both open and have been operating very smoothly for the past few weeks. Uh, they, they continue to be open uh, to only members and for scheduled appointments. Uh, we plan to lengthen the day for both amenities beginning uh, Monday, the 28th of, of September. In terms of programming, uh, we pulled off uh, a baseball program this summer, men's softball still going on, and the sports and programs that we plan to offer for the fall uh, do not involve uh, any sports that fall into the high-risk category. Uh, the only one that does uh, it, that, that we offer is ice hockey, uh, but the protocols for play in, in our building will be strictly adhered to uh, once we get the building open. In terms of that, the ice is down and just about ready. We have uh, one last building inspection scheduled for Tuesday morning, and hopefully hockey uh, will begin shortly thereafter. Uh, back to school programs begin Monday. Uh, before and after care at both Lido and West schools uh, will begin Monday, uh, as well as our sandbox and pre-K programs. And we're knocking on the door uh, with announcements for a uh, – Partnership for new competitive swimming programs and uh, for uh, new swim lesson programs. So that's that's recreation in a nutshell. I tried to keep it as brief as I could given the hour. And uh, any questions? Fire away. Mike. I have a question. This is Liz. Are we, are you taking new membership? Yes. Yes, we are. Anybody that wants to join can join. We're doing a, you know, a host of different types of, of memberships for people to get in uh, in the pool or the weight room. And uh, like I said, you know, like everything else, um, there's new or many, many restrictions and guidelines, but um, we're pretty much fully operational. Um, staff is coming back slowly but surely. Uh, we will be fully operational. Uh, and and essentially have everything offered that we've had offered uh, before COVID. Yeah, Joe, thank you. I think your biggest challenge upcoming is going to be the ice arena. Yeah, it will be. But you know what? Uh, there's a guy that works for uh, the recreation department that knows a thing or two about the ice hockey industry. And uh, he's pretty well in tune with uh, the return to the rinks that USA Hockey has instituted. Um, the, the groups that, that are playing out of there uh, are well-informed and know uh, what the protocols are going to be. Uh, I think we're going to be fine. We're just going to go slow like everything else, open up slowly just as we've done with the pool, what we've done with the, with the weight room and with, with programs. Everything has been kind of at a – not at a snail's pace, but, you know, the, the, the frequent term is a bubble. Like, it, you know, expand the bubble little by little. Uh, and make sure everything's done properly uh, according to guidelines and safely. Thank you, Joe. You're welcome. <clears throat> Any other questions for Joe? All right. Thanks. Thanks for sticking around, Joe. Sorry we uh, kept you for this long. No, I'm watching the hockey game while you were talking. It's no big ah. deal. Oh, how how we doing? Zero zero. Vegas and Dallas. Halfway through. If anyone's interested. Okay. <laughs> Up the Islanders. Next time. Tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. It's been rough. They better do better than they've been doing. That's for sure. Hey, John. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> if we go to welfare, I wanted to ask, uh, since I see Ina is still on, and we were talking about um, leases and things like that, are, are all of our vendors current on their their lease payments that we know of such as i don't know we had a uh, this food trucks in the in may the concessionaires on the boardwalk uh, and any other because i don't i don't plan to know all of them but mm -hmm. does anybody know so uh, actually that's a very good question um i'm not sure that many people are aware but those that uh are dealing with governmental accounting. So you probably know, Mike, about GASB 87. 
So it's a new governmental accounting standards board pronouncement that actually deals with leases was supposed to be implemented for this fiscal year 21, but because of COVID implementation has been postponed until next fiscal year. Um, so basically, in order to be in compliance with this GASB, of what my office is doing is assessing the whole universe of all the leases um, in order to make sure that uh, um, we are um, properly recording everything in um, our financial statements. And uh, there could be... Um, instances where we're collecting payments or making payments uh, without having proper contractual agreements. So that's something that we have now. It's a systemic process that first we're gonna go through all the payments and all the receipts and identify those that could be related to the leases, review the agreements, uh, re re actually review the relationships, make sure that we either have existing agreements or uh, make sure that we establish uh, contracts and uh, evaluate them. Obviously, the, re the rest is a boring stuff for the accounting purposes, but uh, um, we, as far as I know, uh, we really don't have any um, other issues that are um, of this magnitude, um, at, as we discussed before, but again, um, having this very comprehensive uh, review will allow us to make sure that, that uh, we address population of both of leases where we are both leasey and lessor and make sure that, that everything is documented. Yeah, I'm, I was just going to ask that everything's documented and have before we close out, are all the uh, payments and lease payments up to date as far as you know? Yes. Mike, to your yeah. uh, to your question, Mike, I think you did you ask about you asked about uh, food trucks and, and the like? Yeah, the beach season is, is almost end. Well, I hate to say it. as we move to the different season. Are all of the payments up to date as far as uh, you know? Okay. Um, airs and rental trucks and as far as the information I have as of today, the food trucks that are operating um, at the Shogas board are current and up to date. However, our our boardwalk kiosks, I think we only have two um, two kiosk operators who are current, and the rest are either in arrears or outstanding. Um, that's so probably two out of um, how many of uh, five? I'm trying to think. One, two, three. There's about five. A uh, grand uh, national and Pacific. Maybe five. Maybe. Uh, maybe I'm missing one. It's Pacific. So there's, Lincoln, there's uh, that, Riverside. Is that beyond 30, 60, or ninety days? Uh, I believe one of the, it was. Uh, there's two payments or two installments. It depends on the lease, but some were due in June of this year in the middle of the pandemic. Others are due in August, which would be last month. Depends on the lease, but some uh, basically in arrears for to answer your question, Karen, some are more than 30 days. So, so, they, so, so they have multi-year agreements, so we could cancel We could cancel their agreement, right? Uh, most of the agreements have similar provisions. So there are, there are cancellation provisions and notice provisions under which we can kind of, you know, flex that muscle if we wanted to, I guess, or try. Um, but also keep in mind as well that uh, the governor kind of has that moratorium on evictions and the like. So, uh, uh, there are there are definitely <laughs> moratoriums on rent and eviction and. Yep. Uh, so yeah, I would be curious to know the dollar amount, and I know you don't know the answer to this, Rich, but I would be curious to know before we get into December. Um, like who owes how much? What's the status? If we could, and I know. You're on the legal side. This is more, I guess, on the controller and corporate side, you know, the, the collections, I guess. Right. No, I think we could get you the, the overview of it. I mean, you never know. Maybe people will be paying at some point soon. So, well, so yeah, we can get you we can get you the information because I believe and Simone, correct me if I'm wrong. We gave a discount on the rent um, right. because of COVID. Yes. And so 
So it's You're important right. that now we give it, we have given a discount and if we still have not collected the money, we will come back and say, do we need to have that discount removed? Um, okay. Because we weren't paid timely. Um, have, have, so have something that we, the staff will have to discuss and come back with a recommendation. Have the vendors been that haven't paid been contacted and re reminded? Yeah. Do they receive dunning letters? We'll have to check. We'll have to check. Okay, because um, obviously that's a that's sorry, an obvious sure. step. Nina, um, did, Nina, did of they course. Work? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um. So so we have um certain vendors uh that have uh that are questioning uh, some of the charges due to COVID and we're working uh, with them on the, uh, we're, we're reviewing that and uh, I, I work with Donna closely when uh, we have questions of that nature coming up. Um, there is one vendor where I, I, I can think of where material, um, receivables exist it's for the tennis court um i i know that uh amount, amount outstanding where um pretty substantial um i don't have the receivables report in front of me but uh, i'm not aware of any collections on that in in the, in the past uh, um in the past couple of weeks yeah, I think, I think we've met with the tennis court um, and talked about their payment. So we just have to follow up on the meeting. So what we'll do is anybody that is outstanding, we will get in contact with them and ask them when do they anticipate sending the city their money, especially since we're at the end of the season. Great. Uh, well, and Mike, to your question, I believe it's uh, six total as far as uh, kiosks. Yep. Six total. Thank you, Rich. You made two paid, I think you said, or two are current. Two are current. Right. Correct. Two are current. All right. Yeah. We're looking for all the money we can. And Yes. Uh, that, so we'll get you. that information back to you all. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Uh, all right. Look, it's it's 930. It's past Rich's bedtime. So uh, this is uh, this has gone on for uh Two and a half hours, so this is probably a good stopping point. I just ask uh, one question. Sure. Are, are is Steph getting any information from uh, people that want to be up on the boards, on the commissions and boards? Are those are they coming in at a steady rate? Um, they have been coming in. We got a, a stack in just a few days ago. I've been interviewing last week, this week, and next week. Um, I'm starting to put them together so we can discuss them. Okay, Mr. McNally, can we ask um, that another social media post be put up sometime next week? If we can do that, sure. I will. I will give him. Council too. I, I will give him what boards and commissions we need additional people on first. Great. I have to get through the interview. Some people ask to be on two commissions, which we're saying please pick one. And so my agreement was that after I knew how many, which boards and commissions still needed people, that's what we will put out on social media asking for those only particular boards. Because if we put it out now, we'll get boards that, that, that could be potentially be full. Right. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. And if, if I could just- If there's better candidates or different candidates, then everybody should be kind of in the shot. I've had some pretty good candidates come in because yeah. one of the thing, the one main question I ask is, what can you bring to the right. board and commissions? And then I ask questions if you are asked to do something um, to go along, however, ethically you think it is not correct, how would you respond? And people's body language really tells you how they. <laughs> <laughs> good. Good. Well, there's. So, so I would just, if we're, if we're closing up, um, not that anyone needs reminding, but tomorrow is obviously 9-11. Um, the city and various factions of are going to be having our remembrance ceremonies, um, but they are uh, 
largely private's not the right word. We're broadcasting them on Facebook Live for both uh, the one that traditionally happens at the Recreation Center at 8 a.m. Um, and then the firefighters are Facebooking Live. There's for the one at 7.30 p.m. So, um, you know, gatherings need to stay within the 50 person threshold, regardless of what we are gathering for. So these are not necessarily considered public events because uh, we can't dictate what 50 people are allowed to these. So we're, they're private for lack of better terms. Um, but, you know, we, we hope folks do uh, tune in or remember in their own respective ways, um, what is obviously a, a pretty heavy day around here, especially, but for our country as a whole. Okay. Thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. And uh, before we go, Liz, do you want to mention the census? No, it's not a city council meeting. I think oh, John, Liz. Mr. McNally left us on a good note. Okay. Um, all right. So with that, uh, thanks, folks, for joining. And uh, there'll be a city council meeting Tuesday. So uh, we'll see you in a few days. Have a good night. Welcome, Mr. Lupo. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night. Good night, Rich. Good night,